In the Life is funded in part by the H. Van Emmering and Foundation, Arcus Foundation, the estate of Richard W. Wyland, Dewey and LaBeouf, Gill Foundation, and these funders. And by the annual support of In the Life members like you. 30 years after the first AIDS case was reported in the U.S., more than a million Americans are HIV positive. One in five don't know it. And 56,000 are newly infected each year. But if you only watched mainstream media, you would have no idea of the pandemic's ongoing impact. Tonight on In the Life, we look back at 20 years of HIV and AIDS coverage. And later, a frank discussion about HIV prevention and the National AIDS Strategy with the Reverend Charles King, CEO of Housing Works, and actress Harmony Santana from Gun Hill Road. We brought everybody together. Act up! Healthcare is right! And we're married! There was nothing for him to hide. Make a promise. The past was awful, and those of us who are lucky enough to still be alive um, will never be able to convey the hideousness of what life was like then. Most of my friends died, and people dropped dead all over the place. I remember the hospitals, and there were men lying on gurneys because they didn't have rooms for them, and their families had abandoned them, and people didn't know them. Everybody was dying. To this point now that only three of my friends from the 80s are still alive. I've lost everybody to this epidemic. We were going to more memorial services and funerals than birthday parties or celebratory events. It felt like there was this extraordinary crisis happening, and yet at the same time nobody was paying attention. In the Life began broadcasting in 1992, 11 years into the AIDS epidemic. From the beginning, we documented the growing crisis. In the 1980s, the gay community was faced by the sudden emergence of a new disease. AIDS has transformed gay activism, politics, and expression. And ironically, it has strengthened the movement. We were just coming out of a whole decade of living with HIV and losing people in our community from AIDS. And so AIDS and HIV was a very important part of what we reported on, even from the very beginning. And down Christopher Street, thousands march with quiet reverence to honor the dead and to support the living. The media context for AIDS was always bracketed in inevitably fatal, dread disease, fatal illness, 100% fatal, no survivors, terminal illness. The possibility of survival had been taken away from people with HIV. And while there was tremendous loss and incredible pain, there was also this phenomenally vibrant community of people who were leading their lives, even while they were also dealing with a life-threatening illness. I get up at 6.30 in the morning, you know, get myself something, you know, probably drink some coffee or so, and then I get them up at 7. Michelle found out she was HIV positive in 1991, and her six-year-old daughter, Raven, was diagnosed in 1992. So In the Life from the beginning recognized that people with HIV also had other lives. They were more than their disease and has reflected the richness of so many of our lives in a way that it took a long time for other media to, to catch up with. You know, in the beginning, the HIV AIDS crisis really prompted the gay community, thank God, to show real leadership and say, this is a crisis, it's affecting our community, damn it, we're gonna do something about it. And when the government would not even say the word AIDS, really challenging the government to begin funding. In response to the government's lack of action, activist Larry Kramer founded ACT UP to demand that the government and the public pay attention. But now, harder than ever, we must ACT UP, fight back, Fight AIDS! 
We owe him a debt of gratitude for that leadership and that advocacy. Silence equals death. It was true in 1981, and it's still true now. We must never forget that perhaps the greatest achievement that gay people have made in history is those drugs are out there because of ACT UP and Project Inform and other activist groups. They're not there because of the government or anybody else. That's a major, major accomplishment, and it should show us what we as a people are capable of achieving if we all work together. And that same kind of energy could propel the activism, some kind of activism today. Most of the people who were my age, that were involved in the epidemic, that were in ACT UP, felt like we were fighting for our lives. Even those of us who were negative felt like it was our community that was under attack. And ultimately, there was even a feeling that everybody was going to die from this. To your door, we won't take it anymore. Bring our debt to your door, we won't take it anymore. The government's apathy in the face of the fast developing AIDS crisis angered and galvanized the gay community. Outspoken radical groups such as ACT UP aggressively challenged the inaction of the government and the medical establishment. We learned how to work together. We learned in how to have a meeting with a thousand people in it and actually get results. We had committees and committees and committees. Less than 12 hours from now, we are going to be taking over City Hall. People worked together, women joined us in a way that lesbians and gay men had never worked together so well before. Thank God for lesbians. Um, I say that with uh, full sincerity around my sisters. Lesbians have always been an active contingent in the fight against HIV and AIDS. Very early on as care partners and caretakers. The beauty of ACT UP was that it was one of the few places where a room full of men would actually listen to women and ask us for guidance and education and help. The segment on Women of ACT UP chronicled some of the very important contributions made by women and specifically lesbians. Ann Northrup was a moving force, as she continues to be, but really, in the early days, was a out, proud, and sometimes loud activist. And I'm gonna tell you it's your duty to speak up. You must represent yourselves, and you must speak directly to the public. Activism also extended into arts and culture. Many artists with HIV made their illness the focus of their creative work. You understand that your body no longer has any effective mechanism for fighting off anything. Well, I'm going to beat this thing, you know? And every year we would cover more artists and, and, and prominent people in our community that died. It was depressing. It was awful. To think what this community lost in the AIDS epidemic, the amount of talent and energy and beauty that we we witnessed, because these people were actually on the early days of in the life, many of them. While it's impossible to measure the loss of life and contributions to society from AIDS, advancements in medications were starting to allow people to be healthier and live longer. For John Hatchett, 1996 is ending a lot better than it began. I can't describe the, the boost and the rush I got in the month after starting the protease inhibitors. I think everybody thought, um, is this going to last, you know, but it seems to be working. I could feel day to day an improvement in my strength, in my energy level. To be able to report on the first signs of hope after reporting on so much loss um, was remarkable. It was like once combination therapy came out and those who were fortunate enough to have health care and to have access to treatment got it, it was like for a lot of people the epidemic went away. When we finally had three drug combinations, what we now know as heart cocktails, HIV went off the front pages. And so we've lost that whole generation that was 10 years old in 1995. They're now 26 years old. They didn't live through all the death and dying and that fear that we all went through back in those days. James Neal. Jerry. I think it's really important, frankly, that independent media has a voice around these issues because 
independent media has the ability to take an issue and look at it from a perspective that, that you know, the mainstream media doesn't or won't. Through the years, In the Life has provided nuanced coverage of the diversity of HIV and AIDS issues. Somebody's high on crystal meth, they don't feel lonely. They don't feel depressed. They feel like they're the most beautiful, most hot, most amazing thing in the world. When you look at a group of people who's been stigmatized in our culture, and then you add on 25 years of the AIDS crisis, that's a powerful burden. And Crystal kind of wipes all those concerns away. The companies are spending far more money on marketing than they do on research. So we really question if it's wise to spend all this money on these ads, and they also raise the price of the drugs. Acocita is the only clinic in Mexico that provides AIDS drugs to its patients free of charge. Drugs that are brought here from San Diego and elsewhere in the United States. I essentially collect medicines and medical supplies that would normally be thrown away and bring them down here. In the Life has remained at the vanguard of HIV and AIDS coverage by challenging persistent stigma and misconceptions. And one of the pieces they gave me was a form that said, uh, HIV testing at the top, and the third paragraph down, it said that if you're HIV positive, you will be no longer considered eligible for employment. The accusation in the, in the police report was that I had not disclosed my HIV status prior to conducting this relationship. The sentence associated with this could be as much as 30 years in prison. I am so proud of In the Life for taking this on when almost no one else would and dramatically raised awareness within the community and kind of set the stage for subsequent activism. The National AIDS Strategy included a couple of very powerful paragraphs about criminalization and how criminalization has become an obstacle to addressing the epidemic. Having that in the National AIDS Strategy has facilitated all sorts of other conversations. I was really pleased when the administration released its national HIV AIDS strategy because it really was, for the first time, a roadmap to changing the epidemic in America. But it requires political will, political strength, and it requires money. As the need for AIDS research and activism persists, In the Life continues to cover the inspiring conversations between activists at the forefront of the movement. You've been at this for a long time, and, and yeah. do you think we might see a cure at some point? It's only a matter of time, but we are going to get to understand this darn virus and know what it wants and what it needs. Marriage is not a condom. Marriage is not a condom. <laughs> That's why you need condom sense. <laughs> so here we are. And me, less so than you, you a bigger person than I, still to this day have made compromises because of the power um, and the devastation of stigma. Stigma continues to be a really pervasive challenge. Oakland has been hit really hard by AIDS and HIV, and especially in the black community. People who find out that they're positive are not going to get treatment because of the shame associated with it. This is what HIV looks like. Yeah. <laughs> Strong people, yeah. people of faith, yeah. black people. And because black communities were slow to respond to the AIDS epidemic in the beginning, because the AIDS epidemic was mischaracterized as a white gay disease. And so, quite frankly, it's kind of those, the, the old phrase, while you were sleeping. Now, why, while we weren't paying attention, the virus had a chance to take a hold in our communities. We've been able to stabilize the HIV epidemic, not stop, not reduce stabilize. We're never going to control the worldwide epidemic with antiretroviral therapy. It's just not going to happen given where the epidemic is and given how it spreads. It won't work. We need a vaccine. Every nine and a half minutes there's a new HIV infection in our country. It became very clear that to a lot of men, and, and many men actually used these words, that HIV isn't a big deal anymore. Well-educated men believed that HIV was curable and that taking uh, antiretroviral therapy would prevent them from transmitting it. You know, over the course of really 25 years, we went from, you know, average life expectancies that were in the months to today where people are living decades with this disease. I don't know how you bring back the urgency. People die all the time from HIV and HIV-related conditions. How can we get the message out to 
13 to 29 year olds. Now we're looking at how do we begin to get testing into venues that are not considered traditional venues. And people my age. How do we get the message out to people in their late 40s and 50s and 60s? Look straight over my shoulder. There are times when I still wish we could take to the streets. There are times when I wish there were enough people around who still had that mentality that we could take to the streets to battle some of the battles that are going on in Washington now. You don't get what you don't fight for, and you don't get, you don't get anything by being nice. I am always amazed at the dynamic power of moving out of who we are as individuals and coming together as friends, as family, neighbors, co-workers, and people of conscience to make a difference. We've accomplished so much and we can help people in such great ways. I just wish the message was out there though, it's much better not to be HIV positive than to be HIV positive. Enough time has passed from the worst of the epidemic that people can look back and process grief and think about what that time meant. We need to understand how easily it can happen again and how in ways it is still happening. If there is a silver lining to this epidemic, it is perhaps that it empowered the gay community in a way that I can't imagine anything else could have. On the other hand, I think about, you know, the people that we lost and um, what our lives would be like, how they would be different if those people were here and the friends that I lost in those, you know, in those really difficult days. That, I think, that would mean it would, the world would definitely be a much better place if they were here. In the 2011 film Gun Hill Road, Harmony Santana gives an inspiring performance as 16-year-old Michael, a teenager in the Bronx undergoing a transformation just as her father returns home from prison. It ain't like I never cut class before, but don't lie to me. You can't just follow me around, Bobby. Sit down. I don't go following you around. Well, so put your hands, man. Put your hands down and talk to me like a man. I didn't raise you to be like that. You didn't raise me. You can't just come in here and try to be Bobby now. Harmony drew on her past experience as a homeless teen for the role. She is part of a new generation of LGBT activists who are coming of age three decades after the AIDS epidemic began. Representing an earlier generation of activism, the Reverend Charles King is a Baptist minister and a relentless advocate for ending the dual crisis of homelessness and AIDS. He is the CEO of Housing Works. If you ever ask yourself what Housing Works is all about, this is it. Known for its thrift stores around New York City, Housing Works was founded in 1990 as an advocacy, service, and social enterprise organization for people living with HIV and AIDS. Charles and Harmony came to In the Life Studios to discuss Hi. advocacy, Hello. HIV, and their work. So, Harmony, I understand you were discovered for Gun Hill Road while you were mm -hmm. working as a volunteer at the Queen's Pride Parade. I used to work for Harlem United and Bronx Aid Services, HIV prevention and things like that. And I was a peer educator. I was handing out condoms and flyers, trying to get people to get tested. And Rashad came by with a flyer for the movie. And I stood up, I was like, well, can I audition? So I went in, auditioned. He told me to come back a second time as a girl because at the time I was dressing as a boy still. And he told me I got the role. That's great. Had you done any AIDS activism before your work um, as a peer? I moved to New York in 2009. I didn't have a job or anything, and I had to do things to be able to, like, eat even, you know what I mean? I know what you mean. And um, a friend of mine told me about Bronx Day Services, and it was like an open space for LGBT youth to go in and discuss their feelings and eat because um, they brought food in. And I did programs like Code Red. It teaches you about HIV and everything. Mm -hmm. And I told myself, I was like, I want to be one of these people. Later on, I found out one of my best friends has HIV. It just pushed me more into becoming an activist. So Charles, you're a Baptist, and... Uh, what you trying to say? 
Well, we're, we're kind of a fire and brimstone kind of folks. We're, mm -hmm. we're kind of absolutist. And so I was raised in a preacher family. So when the time comes to stand up, I never have any problem standing up. You have interrupted President Obama. I did. At an HIV and AIDS White House event. Can you tell me more about that? Sure. The National AIDS Strategy is a political document. It was meant to satisfy the AIDS community that the president was serious about doing something. But if you dig deep into the document, it doesn't really offer up that much. Uh, at the time that I was invited to the White House for the unveiling of the strategy, uh, there were already over 6,000 people around the country on waiting lists for antiretroviral drugs. So I interrupted the president to ask him about that. We're investing $30 million in new money, and I've committed to working with Congress to make sure these investments continue in the future. The second. Uh, 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 hold, uh, let's, uh, hold on. You can talk to me after. We, we'll be able to talk after, after I speak. That's why I invited you here. I feel that President Obama needs to be called on HIV and AIDS, just like mm -hmm. President Bush needed to be called on it. I think it's misguided for us to just assume that he's going to do the right thing. What would you say to other HIV and AIDS activists who think that the national AIDS strategy is the first step? In many ways, it could be considered a first step. For the first time, it spells out very clearly the levels of the epidemic and, and the need to address the epidemic among men who have sex with men. Mm -hmm. But in many ways, it's also a step backwards. It mentions young adults, but doesn't even include the Department of Education in the AIDS strategy. Right. And it really doesn't talk about youth prevention at all. It almost completely ignores women. So it took essentially the same pot of money and shuffled it around. To me, that's not a real strategy to end mm -hmm. the epidemic. And in fact, at best, it's a strategy to maintain the epidemic. Why do you feel there's so little funding for HIV and AIDS prevention? AIDS is a, a disease that is fueled by poverty and inequities. Mm -hmm. So people who are already the most marginalized, whether it's IV drug users or or gay men or transgender folk are the folk who are going to be most at risk. And the reality is our society doesn't think that those lives are worth saving. So instead of bringing the AIDS epidemic to an end, which we actually could at this point, we throw enough money at it just to appease the activists without ever developing a serious global strategy to end the epidemic. At the White House, uh, if I'm given an opportunity to to speak up, I'm going to speak up. Then it's very brave of you. <laughs> well, <laughs> it was actually kind of fun. Okay. Um, but I don't think it's any braver than doing civil disobedience or anything else. Tell me about your own experience. You left home at an early age. Well, I never really had a relationship with my father. Growing up, like in Gun Hill Road, he wasn't really around. I went through a lot of mental abuse with him. He was very uh, angry when he saw me do girly things. I don't know. I think that if he was different and was there for me and, you know, how I want him to be, I wouldn't be the person I am today. And you're, you're actually living in a supportive housing program right now? I am. Green Chimneys. And how is it? It's amazing. We really need more programs like this because there's so many homeless youth in New York. I got my, my name changed, everything to help me with my transition. They referred me to Canon Lord, which is where the clinic where I'm going to for my hormones. Access to hormones is one of the biggest HIV prevention things that you can do for mm -hmm. folk who are transgender because if you've got to buy it on the black market, inevitably you engage in sex work. But then if you're injecting, a lot of times that involves shared needles. And even worse is if somebody decides to inject silicone. In the film Gun Hill Road, there was a scene where I, um, my character goes to get pumped with silicone. And it gets hormones from like the black market. You want anything on top? No. Papi will kill me. Okay, just the cooler. Okay. Here, you can hold me if you want, Mama. Oh, hell no. <gasps> Try not to move. Can you pass me that, please? This? 
Thank you. What the f It is the fastest way. Does it look good? You gonna look hot, mamita. To me, that was a very powerful scene. Um, I never went and got pumped or um, or gotten hormones from like that kind of person. It's something I've known about because a lot of the girls talk about it. It's very scary. And I felt like I was living that for a moment. Just knowing that HIV can be transmitted through like sharing needles. I'm proud of putting that out there. Um, mm -hmm. I'm proud of being in that scene. I'm proud of showing the world what transgenders go through. Well, I think one of the things that this speaks to is that there's just a, an incredible lack of awareness about transgender issues. This winter, in January, February, we're going to be doing trips up to Albany. We'll be organizing for the Gender Identity and Expression Act, uh, Transgender Rights Bill statewide. Uh, how about you come up with us? I would love to. <laughs> okay. I would love to. We need to raise a, a new generation of, of young activists. And right. that's why I think you're, you're such a great role model. Here I am. I'm in my mid-50s and been around doing this and look like somebody's grandpa. I think you and people like you are really good voices to speak out, not just to the powers that be, but to other young people and get them engaged and involved mm -hmm. in fighting these systemic issues that are still hurting our communities. Well, Charles, it was a pleasure talking to you. It's Great to meet you, Harmony, and I expect to see you up in Albany in just a few months. Definitely. Thank you for watching In the Life. To watch more historical coverage from the last 20 years of In the Life, visit our website at itlmedia.org. You know, In the Life is a really wonderful gift to the community, and I think sometimes, like many gifts, people don't fully appreciate them. In the Life, um, always has included HIV and AIDS as part of the, unfortunately, but part of the fabric of the LGBT community. We both hope for the day when that's no longer the case, but that's not today. In the Life is funded in part by the H. Van Emmering and Foundation, Arcus Foundation, the estate of Richard W. Wyland. Dewey and LaBeouf, Gill Foundation, and these funders. And by the annual support of In the Life members like you.